Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Don from Climate Emergency UK, and my talk is on scoring UK councils on their climate action. Uh, just to give you a bit of background on who Climate Emergency UK is, uh, we were set up in 2019 at the height of the climate movement. We saw council chambers being packed with campaigners when the motions to pass the climate declarations were happening. However, uh, since that's happened, um, over 85% councils have declared climate emergency, but people are finding it increasingly hard to identify what they can ask their council to do. And this is where we come. Us as a team of four staff, but also relying on 200 volunteers and 50 consultants to come in and uh, try to answer these questions on what can you ca ask your council to do. We are also part of the Blueprint Coalitions, which lobbies the national government. Our mission is to inform residents about climate action happening in their local area. We provide the tools and the trainings to campaigners to lobby effectively. We show councils how they can improve and where they can find best practice from other councils across the UK. And as I mentioned before, we also encourage further support and funding from the UK government to councils. And our end goal is to help reduce UK emission by a third, as this is what's within the council's influence to reduce. So what are the scorecards? The scorecard is a holistic assessment of council climate action happening all across the UK. We've assessed all 389 councils on their climate action. We defined 91 actions that council can take to tackle both the climate and ecological emergencies. For each one of these questions, we had to either find a data set that already existed or create a brand new one. And most of this work has been done by volunteers who are crowdsourcing the data. The 91 actions we defined are organized around seven themes, uh, which you can see on the screen. Biodiversity and heating and transport are two huge domains the council can take action on, but they're also the one where they are the most limited in, as most of these actions need a lot of infrastructure and funding, which is lacking from the UK government. Planning and land use is also an enormous uh, responsibility that council uh, have because they can decide what are the requirements for a new building to be built uh, within their local area and they have quite a lot of uh, flexibility on where they can set the standards. One of the action that we have included in the scorecards is, is there a requirement for new building development to be net zero? Governance and finance is the about the overarching structure that guides and allow climate actions. It's about, for example, do you have a climate action plan? But have you also included your net zero target all across the board in your corporate plan, as well as your procurement policies, or is it just an isolated policy? Biodiversity is a section that is unfortunately not looked at with enough attention. It's the section where council score the worst, um, and that's maybe because it's, there's just not been a, as much emphasis so far on what councils can do to protect nature. But we've identified 11 actions that they can do, from banning pesticides to um, protecting um, local wildlife areas. Collaboration and engagement is also hugely important. It's about how your councils engage with local citizens and make sure that their voice is heard and that we transition to net zero in a fair and just way. Finally, waste and reduction and food looks at uh, redistribution of food as well as uh, recycling and um, other related issues. So what are the scorecards? It's a three-stage process which involved over 90 sector organizations and individuals who helped us define actions that are within the po power of council to do and to set a standard of where we would what level of action we would like them to take. It's also a unique partnership between a civil tech organization, my society, and a climate non-for-profit. 
um, climate Mississippi did all the research and uh, consultations to find out what those questions were. But my society allowed us to put all this information in a way that is easily accessible, that anyone can access online um, and understand Council Climate Action better. They've also given us the tool uh, to communicate with our volunteers and facilitate the crowds crowdsourcing process. Um, so creating the scorecards took oh, a really long time. There's a timeline on the screen. I might not go through all of it. Uh, but we started researching the scorecards in April 2022. Uh, we consulted within the sector uh, during the first year. We published some metrics in December 2022. And then after that, we recruited 200 volunteers to do our first mark of UK Council Climate Action. Councils were given a five-year, sorry, five-week right of reply period so they could complement any information that we found on their climate action. We then audited the data uh, to reduce the amount of error and we published last October. How are the questions scored? There are five types of councils in the UK and therefore we had to adapt our questionnaires between single tier councils, which um, is a majority of councils in the UK, but they have the most power. Then you have district and county councils, which have powers of the single tier but divided between the two. Combined authority is a newer structure and Northern Ireland councils are entirely different. So we took into account the real world differences and adjusted our scoring depending on each uh, council's responsibilities and what do they have the most influence on. Uh, to put together the scorecards, we relied on three types of data sets. Uh, I mentioned volunteer research before. So looking at all the council websites that exist, but we also used national data collected both by the UK government as well as other agencies like Active Travel England, for example. And most importantly, we use freedom of information requests um, to ask information that was not previously uh, searchable. So for example, has your council investment in fossil fuel projects? Um, what sort of trainings have they providing to their councillors? Do your local politician understand environmental issues? And for each question, we've also attributed different weightings, low, medium, or high, depending on how impactful the action is and how much of effort is required to take it. So just to give you a little background on the data collection process, um, in 2021, we created the Council Climate Plan Scorecards um, so in this, in this exercise, uh, we used our database of climate plans from all the councils in the UK, and we, we ranked them and scored them depending on how ambitious they were. And to do that, we, we did recruit over 100 volunteers, and we asked them to uh, analyze the climate plans, and we used Google Sheets, and that proved to be quite a messy process. Um, with a lot of information moving around and a lot of room for human error. So when the 2023 Council Climate Action Scorecard came up, we were faced with a much bigger challenge because we were now assessing real life action and not just plans. And therefore we needed a, a more robust way to collect information. And this is why uh, Mass Society helped us create an online portal uh, to help volunteers complete the scoring. And that helped us streamline the way co data is collected and processed and avoid errors. The scorecard results are on the whole um, quite low. Uh, with only 41 councils having scored 50% uh, or more. However, if you look at the details, some councils are doing brilliantly in some areas. Um, so the, the whole interest of the scorecard is really going into the details and finding uh, where they are doing good at and not, not just the averages. Um, what you can see the, the scores are quite low, no matter the type of council, but what's really interesting is the range. So even within the same category of councils, for example, district councils, the scores vary from 8% to 
So even with the, the same amount of powers, and it shows that some other factors are at play, and we think political will is a big one, as well as local support for climate policies. We published a report earlier this year which analyzed the trends in the data. Uh, our research partner, Antesis, looked at the characteristics enabling local climate action. Uh, we found that having a climate action portfolio holder, so that's a councillor that is named as responsible for championing climate action within the council, is the characteristic which has the most impact on the scores with 11% uh, better climate action. The next one was uh, councils that have raised income. So in the scorecards, we identify three ways in which councils can raise money through cli climate action, and that's by raising revenue through development, as well as um, applying for funding from the government as and uh, lo issuing local climate bonds, so raising funding from the private sector. Uh, and that was associ associated with 9%, 11%. So those councils who found the extra funding that they needed uh, also achieved better climate action. And finally, um, in governance, though the council who embedded net zero all across their policies also scored 9% uh, higher. Uh, now I'm going to give you some examples of how the scorecards have been used in the real world um, and how this data has been useful. So my first example is communities, um, climate action Durham is a small uh, climate activist group in uh, the northeast of England. And they use the scorecards to look at their council climate action and inform their local residents on what is happening within their local area. They also invited the council to join in. And this event is now something that is being repeated on a yearly basis as a way to hold the council accountable and allow residents to ask question directly to their councils. It's also a prioritization exercise. Uh, the local residents are giving the information of what is already happening and where are the gaps. And they come up with solutions. And it also allows the council to get public support. Uh, for example, the one of the recommendations of the last meeting was to increase uh, parking charges as a way to raise the revenue to build more cycle lanes, which uh, often is would be an unpopular to do. Um, another example of how the scorecards have been useful uh, for people to take action, um, another audience is council officers themselves, um, and this example is Rufford Street Council. They declared the climate emergency back in 2019, however, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the staff changes, not much happened after they declared the climate emergency. So they found themselves in 2022 and still not having a climate action plan. So a new officer, uh, Lucy Bolton, uh, had a look at the scorecards and she found a wealth of information about the climate action plan happening all across the UK. And she took inspiration from it to write uh, Rufford District Council's uh, first climate action plan based on knowledge from all across the UK. And then when it came to actually implementing the climate action plan, she looked at the scorecards again and found, for example, that eliminating pesticides was one of the actions we were recommending. And it's quite easy to do. It doesn't uh, cost a lot. And so she was able to prioritize that, um, having found real life examples from across the UK of other councils who have done this, showing it's possible. Because on each one of the action, you can click on the evidence that shows you uh, the real life projects uh, and examples. Uh, what I would encourage you to do after this talk is to go on our website, the Council Climate Scorecards, check your local schools, uh, contact your local councillors about it, and you can also volunteer with the Climate Emergency UK as we are currently updating our scores to be released next year. Um, so if you are interested, uh, we are recruiting volunteers and we really appreciate your help. Thank you.